Hello, good afternoon. So you'll never be alone anymore. Um, before we dive into that, I would like to introduce myself very briefly. Uh, I'm Paolo and I work for Automatic. I'm Italian indeed, that is all true. I do live in Vienna, Austria though. And um, I want to talk to you about AI today, but not, we're not going to make our laundry together here today. I, so why are we here? We are here to look at AI a little bit differently, out of the hype, out of the technology, out of the worries or the big hopes of a, a, a futuristic tool that would do everything for us. I want to look at it just as a tool we can use every day to reimagine your, our craft. And uh, most of the examples I will use uh, uh, today come from creating content. Uh, they apply equally to designing website, to coding, just I wanted to narrow the scope a little bit. And uh, to narrow it even more, I want to look at three particular areas where uh, the recent AI tools can help us. And they are practice, collaboration, and diversity. So remember those three things. We're going to get to those and explain in detail how this can happen for you. There is a point I'd really like to make, um, and it is, I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the legend of Archer, uh, who became king by pulling uh, the sword out of a rock. Some of you may have read uh, the old legend, some of you may have watched the Disney movie. If you're French, uh, you might have watched Camelot. There's a number of, uh, of movies and, and TV shows about that. What it says is that the sword was critical, like the only the person who could remove the sword from the rock could become king. But the important thing to remember is that it's called the legend of King Archer and not the legend of Excalibur. And so I want to explain how AI is that for us. It's a tool, it's something that enables things that are unimaginable before, but it's only that. So, before we dive into the three principles, let's look a little bit at uh, um, <clears throat> what is AI today. I would say that AI is more than just code and algorithms, in the same way that I would say that the printing press is more than just uh, screws and knots and levers and uh, gears. It's made of those things, but it serves a purpose that is much more important. And uh, by the way, AI has been around, as many of you, probably all of you know, for many, many years. It's not something that was uh, uh, invented three years ago. Uh, we called it machine learning for a long time because AI was kind of the aspirational goal, the aspirational uh, target when it would actually become sentient or something like that. And then at some point we decided that, well, it's not sentient, but it's good enough that we're going to use AI uh, every day. That's probably more uh, marketing than anything else. But really, um, what is interesting is that it's a sort of mathematical representation of our language. And um, what it does is that it enables us to manipulate, transform, and generate text. And uh, what's very interesting is that text can be text as in content, but text can be text as in instructions. And so, with those tools, we can also program machines. It's not just limited to writing uh, English, French, uh, uh, Chinese, or any other language. And uh, with similar tools, we can also manipulate pixels and manipulate images. And so, we expand the possibilities of what we can do as humans, because one of the characteristics of AI, although a lot of people say it's slow, it's much, much faster than we are. <laughs> it's not as fast as we wish, but it's very, it's very fast. So, it's a tool that can manipulate language and images, and language can become instruction, and so it can drive machines. And like every powerful tool, 
there is a potential dark side. So I want to get this out of the way uh, so that then we can talk about the really interesting stuff. Um, before we dive into really the, 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 the scary stuff, let's talk about what AI is not beyond the hype. AI is not this sentient tool that is going to put all of us under a bridge and take all our jobs and do everything we do today and like magically. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen anytime soon, uh, at least. And when I say soon, I doubt it. Personally, I doubt it will happen in our lifetime, but uh, definitely it's not going to happen in the next few years. It's not the opposite either. It's not that magic wand that you can use and you know, will make of you a billionaire without doing anything and without bringing any value. It's not that because, again, it's a tool. Um, it's not really a tool that is going to make you successful by you know, automatically creating tons of content and, uh, uh, you know, for SEO purpose or linking farms or things like that, that's not going to work very well because we have to remember, as we build the tools that could technically create all that content, we also build the tools that can understand that that content has been created that way. And so without the human creativity in the middle, it's going to be very easy to, um, to clear up the field. I think that... We are in a position now where, like, it always happens, like, there's a bit of a gap between how a technology is used and its true potential. But I don't think that automatically generated content will be successful for a, for a very long time because... Uh, but anyway, the fact is, every sword, going back to Excalibur, has two edges. And AI is not an exception. And that leads us to the fact that your responsibility as the user of those tools is engaged. Now, you might have heard, for example, about all the copyright problems around AI. There are issues with image creation, with text generation. There are uh, different uh, trials going on. There's like questions about, hey, is AI stealing the work of uh, artists or writers or creators, and um, I, I don't have an answer. This is not legal advice, and I'm not a lawyer. But what I can say is that we, as the user of AI, are in charge of what the output actually is. We are, the, at the end of the process, the ones hitting the publish button and deciding this is okay, this is not okay. I would argue that uh, a normal keyboard or a pen doesn't commit crime, but it makes it possible. Like, a tool is a tool, depending on how you use it, you can actually be infringing on someone's copyright or you can be infringing on someone's terms of service, but the eye is not responsible for that. I go back to the fact it is just a tool. So we have to inject our creativity, and we have to commit our responsibility to use it in a way that amplifies us, enhances us, but doesn't infringe on, anybody, on, any, on anyone else's uh, uh, rights. So um, I wanted to introduce with all that, that is sort of... Uh, those are questions that people have, and I wanted to get them out of the way because I want to talk about something a lot more important that these tools can allow us to do. And um, three principles, I think, can be underlined here. The first one is that quantity leads to quality. The second one is that collaboration enhances quality. And the last one is that diversity improves quality. And we're going to go through those one by one. So quantity leads to quality. You might uh, have heard, and if you have been in any uh, internet course in the last couple of years, you probably had that example, especially if it was a writing or a creative course, um, where you have heard this parable of, the teacher that uh, gave 
an assignment to students uh, in a pottery class. Uh, but he didn't give the same assignment to all students. They gave an assignment to half of the student that was, over a month, please produce as many pieces as you can. You will be graded based on weight of the ensemble of pieces you have created. To the other half, he said, bring me the best piece you made this month, and you'll be graded on the quality of that piece. And the month went by, and so half of the class came with like trucks full of, <laughs> of pots and, 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 and dishes. The other half came with one piece each. And what is very interesting is the fact that the best pieces were actually among those who had made a ton of pieces, as opposed to the ones who tried to perfect one. Now, this, um, this parable is in a, in a book uh, from 2001, that uh, the funny story is that it's actually not true in the sense that James Clear published Atomic Habits a few years ago and mentions the same story with a photography teacher. And so this photography teacher did the same thing though, asked half of the class to uh, make as many photos as they could over a month and bring them and they would be uh, graded on the quantity whereas the other half would have to bring one photo. Same end, of course, as you can imagine. And the interesting part is that the photography story is actually the original. The writers of the book in 2001 decided to use pottery instead. The funny thing is they were photographers and they were trying to diversify their examples. And, uh, but the gist of this is the more you do something, the better you become at it. And if you have ever created any content, you know that this is how it works. If you do that every day, you become better and better and better. Now, how does AI allow you to do that more and more frequently? Let it do all the grunt work. Like, in every creative act, there is a ton of little tasks that are not really creative. Um, if you're writing, it can be proofreading and checking for typos, and it can be maybe translating, because maybe you want to publish in English, but in English is not your native language, so you need a translator tool. Or maybe it's, uh, um, if you're, I don't know, if you're publishing on, a, on WordPress, you need to create an excerpt every time you write a blog post. And the excerpt is not really a creative exercise, the content is in the post, so if you can automate that part, you can uh, save time. Or maybe you want your post to have featured images, but you're absolutely not good at creating images in any way. You can use AI tools for that. Or if you're writing code, for example, you might realize that every time you start work on a new plugin, there's a lot of like steps that are sort of mandatory. You have to prepare a lot of boilerplate content and file structure that is not really creative. So by removing all those pieces, you can do more and more of the uh, part that really contains the value and really improves you. And um, basically, is use AI as your creative partner. You don't ask it to do the creative work. You ask it to relieve you from all the little tasks that are actually not bringing you any value. And uh, that can take many, many shapes. Um, I'll give a, an example, something I do personally quite a bit. I have learned over time that when you write, it's really important to limit a, a post to a single idea. If you want to be strong, if you want your message to be strong, you should limit your post to a single idea. The problem is that A, I tend to fall in love with my ideas, so I have a hard time discarding them. I don't know if anyone here experiences that. And the second problem is that sometimes I have, even have a hard time finding the line between the ideas. So a method I found that is practical is that I'll write a draft and then I'll give it to an AI to say, create an outline out of this draft. Now, in the outline, it makes, <clears throat> it, makes it a lot more visible for me which different ideas are uh, expressed and I can then split them. And then I take these diff three different outlines, for example, and I go rewrite a post for each one of them. You can move one step further. You can actually tell the AI, okay, give me an outline. Then you split it manually. You find where the lines are. And then you say, well, in my original text, 
organize the pieces based on these new three outlines. So I'm not talking about here AI writing for you as much as having a sort of back and forth that allows you to um, improve and go faster. The key is go faster. Like something that is incredibly hard in writing is to shorten. It takes a lot more time than writing a lot. And so any tool, any assistance you can get in shortening is really welcome. Um, collaboration. That is the second one. Collaboration enhances quality. Is anyone here who has already used friends or family or colleagues to get feedback on some post or article you wanted to write? Raise your hand if you're here. Yes, I see a few hands. Wouldn't you agree that in general, those are your best pieces? When you take the time to get back and forth with people, you have incredibly good insights in what you're writing and they really help you and sometimes something seems obvious to you and maybe it's not. Problem is that unless you're a professional writer, it's hard to, to do that all the time because you want to write frequently, but also your friends and family, well, it happens that they have lives and jobs and not that much free time. So you can't keep going over and over to them. And the more you do it, the more you have to be flexible with the time they take to do it. So now suddenly they give you feedback a week or two weeks later, and that's not really manageable. But those tools are available for you every day, and they never sleep. And so use your friends and family whenever it's possible, but don't hesitate to ask the tool for feedback. AI can give you pretty good feedback on your text. It is kind of mesmerizing that it works, but it does work. And by giving you feedback, it will trigger your brain and will lead you again to improve the quality of your, uh, of your text. So this is a way to democratize feedback. Another point that is really interesting is that we live in a world where we write something, we put out a few ideas, but then there's multiple places where we're supposed to, to share them. We probably have a blog. I mean, if you're in this room, I do hope it's on WordPress. And then we might have social media, maybe Twitter, or maybe not Twitter anymore, maybe um, LinkedIn or anything else. And you want to adapt your content to the format of those different platforms. They might uh, work better with certain length of text or certain approaches, certain tone. And so you can get help from AI, for example, let's say that you wrote something that is on your blog and it has a fairly informal tone because your blog is your property and you're talking to people who follow you, and then you want that same piece of uh, impact on LinkedIn, you might decide that that tone was a little bit too friendly, too informal. You can easily ask AI to help you with that. And uh, what happens there is that Again, we're talking about your input, your ideas, your content. You're not asking AI to write for you. You're asking AI to help you improve your writing. So you can get a sort of assistant that is constantly there for you, constantly working with you, and constantly helping you. And I was going to say free. They're not free, but they're extremely cheap. So, And then another point is diversity. And I think this one in 2024 is really important to stress because what happens when you, even if you have access to a lot of friends and colleagues that are ready to give you feedback and dedicate time to help you, very often they will be fairly similar to you in terms of ideas. They might work in the same company, they might live in the same city, they might be around the same age, maybe you went to school together it's very easy to be in a sort of social bubble in which there isn't so much confrontation of very different ideas. But when I write something, I am not overly interested in convincing people who think like me already. That is a marginal value. What I'm really interested in, how do I make my message heard by everyone else? And it's actually uh, completely possible to ask the AI to sort of counter you and counter your arguments. So basically you say, hey, I wrote this draft. 
tell me all the ways I'm wrong. Or I wrote this draft, impersonate that type of person and tell me where I'm wrong. Or tell me what is missing. Tell me which points are not clear. Tell me which assumptions, for example, I'm making that would not match that type of person. And those are all tools that actually uh, functions ex function extremely well. Because again, you're not asking the AI to generate content, which is always going to be a bit average because of the way it works. It's a, it's a probabilistic machine. It takes the most um, likely word to come after another word and another word. So it doesn't create a lot of um, novelty unless you you know, raise that parameter that is called temperature and then it becomes like uh, almost impossible to follow, but that's not interesting. But here you're giving your content, and so you're asking the AI to push back on your content. Um, you challenge yourself, and you challenge yourself in a way that I have to say is a lot more comfortable than with people. Because when you ask the same thing to people, admitting that you have in your circle the right people to ask to, then it's very hard not to enter into an argument with those people. Because now suddenly you're not giving feedback about a piece anymore, now you're debating your ideas. With a machine, that doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen. <laughs> you shouldn't get angry at machines. Um, so that's uh, actually uh, a really powerful tool to improve and to uh, increase diversity. And then there is the idea that sometimes you're writing text that you know is going to be attacked. Like maybe you're writing uh, uh, f you know, a press release, maybe you're writing uh, an announcement for a new product and you know that you have competition, maybe you're writing a, an opinion, I don't know, maybe your career is in politics and you're writing about your platform. It, but, but there are moments where you're like, okay, there's going to be specific people that are actually my opponents, I'm competing with them in this context, and um, it, would be, it would be perfect if I could have people playing the role of what's called red team to attack my content. But again, it's not always easy to have that available or it costs a lot of time and money. The, these tools can do that. LLMs are really good at that. Remember, though, you should not get angry with them. <laughs> there is no point in, uh, in doing that. So, quantity, collaboration, and diversity are three additions that these tools bring to you, in which you don't ask the tool to create for you, you're actually doing all the creative part, and you're letting the tool provide input, provide services, and provide challenges, in a way that your content becomes better and better and better. And I really encourage you to do those things. You can, uh, very interestingly, there's more and more ways to sort of pre-program an LLM. So for example, uh, in ChatGPT, you have the GPTs that you can actually set to do a specific task. And so then it becomes even easier. You don't have to write a lot of prompts. You just prov give your draft, and then the dialogue starts there. And of course, there's a number of other tools. So I wanted, to, I wanted to take a moment to talk about the tools briefly. I realize it's hard, because uh, if you start an AI presentation based on tools, um, it's up to date when you start the presentation. It's outdated when you finish it. Um, so I'm not going to go too deep into the details, but fundamentally you have all those tools through chat interfaces that are ready for you at your fingertips. You have ChatGPT, you have Claude from Anthropic, you have uh, Gemini, I think is the name today of the Google thing, although it changes often, but I think it's Gemini now. Um, you have a number of tools that bring that into your editor. So you have uh, Lex, we have uh, Jetpack or something like that. Uh, Warp, um, Microsoft has uh, integrated the tools in, uh, in Office, so you can find those tools generally where you work. You don't have to go left and right, <coughs> simplifying a lot of the sort of uh, copy-paste and formatting problem that can be annoying. 
And um, you have, of course, the coding side. You have uh, tools like Copilot uh, that is available um, for everyone, I think, now. And, and many others. It's like it, there's, there's a new tool coming out uh, about every few days. But they're all like right now, we're all in the same area, roughly. These LLMs, large language models, that are able to generate, transform, and manipulate text. And then we have the image side with the uh, stable diffusion, Midjourney, or DALI that are able to generate images. That is sort of the state of what we have access to as normal users, regular users uh, nowadays. Of course, what this is going to look like uh, tomorrow, next week, a year from now, we don't know yet. There was an interesting thing uh, very recently. Uh, Anthropic launched uh, uh, Claude 3 that apparently recognizes when it's tested. So we're getting into a strange uh, territory. We don't have time to go into the details here. Um, the one thing I want to mention is that those tools are constantly changing. And this is the only constant, is change. So fundamentally, we look at what doesn't change. And what doesn't change is that we humans are storytellers. From Lascaux and the caves where people painted on the walls tens of thousands of years ago, to today with LLMs and in the middle with uh, you know, wax tablets and papyrus and then the printing press, all those are tools at the service of telling stories. And telling stories are about creating, about sharing, about convincing. Everything we do as humans is telling stories. Whether we sell, whether we are in politics, whether we teach. <clears throat> and so the tools don't matter that much. Today, we have this tool to use. Think, I go back to the printing press. The printing press was probably one of the biggest advances in human history. Today, they're in museums. Nobody uses them anymore today. They're beautiful, and they were incredible, but we don't need them today. We have digital printing. And then we have online. We read on screen. We can generate audio, video. So look at these tools like today. This is how I accelerate. Think about the painters of the Renaissance who had to be chemists. And you know they had to mi mix egg yolk with some flour and some iron rust to make colors. And then someone invented industrial paint, and they opened a shop, and they start selling the paint. Well, it didn't reduce the ability of the previous painters to paint. What it did is open that to many others. And so this is what those tools are doing, is they're opening the door for all many, many more people to actually become storytellers and improve their craft. So in conclusion, um, the future is not written, so we don't know what's going to happen. But we can use today AI as a companion to become better and better at telling stories, which are the core of our essence as humans. And uh, the important thing, I think, is that in our legend, the legend we all write today, every day about ourselves, um, we can be Archer and not Excalibur. We can be the hero and have the AI help us as a tool. That's it for me today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo. We have 10 minutes for questions and answers. Drink some water. I think there is a question. I don't know if we have a microphone that goes around or. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences and uh, really working and collaborating to create content with AI. I find that actually a pretty unique perspective in utilizing uh, chatbots these days. As a question, I'm sort of wondering, 
how are you finding, say, custom instructions, styles, and tones to be, uh, say, modifying the work that you are wanting to be creating? And I admit, not just talking about, say, a tone of professional or empathetic, but actually going into a, an extensive uh, nuanced tone or style. So these are good questions. So what I've, uh, what I've been doing is twofold. On the one side, there's these sort of um, custom instructions that you can give at the beginning, and I have a, a collection of those. I use like expander, like I use expander snippets to to replace them quite often, um, because if I'm writing for my blog, for example, I'm not going to give the same instructions as if I'm writing for work. Um, what I find, especially now that the context window has become bigger and bigger, uh, what I find very effective is that I will take two or three of the posts that I consider my best. For be I mean, I might be wrong, but I like them. And I will provide that as, uh, uh, as examples. And so I will, uh, again, with, with uh, expanding snippets, I will say, you know, look at, uh, for example, one, one example where I get the eye to write is when I give a draft and then break it down into pieces, and then I ask it to rewrite. I tell it, A, use the content I provided at the beginning. Try not to go out of that. B, here's an example of two, three posts that I wrote and I'm really happy about to give you a sense of the tone. I tried something that doesn't work so well, at least not for me, is that I tried in the past to do that sort of once and for all, sort of giving content to the, the tool and say, describe my style and tone and this and that so that I could reuse it. That didn't work because the description was very generic, again, for the reasons we, we know. So you, you, you end up having to provide content more and more. Now, what's interesting, for example, uh, we're talking about Claude 3 that was just launched. It has two things that are really interesting. One is a 200,000 token context window. That means that you can, that's probably about 160,000 words. So you can really load a bunch of content. And what's interesting is that there is one test that is popular when testing those LLMs. It's called the needle in a haystack. You sort of say, well, can it find a single reference in a very big text without having to repeat that thing over and over again? And oftentimes, they used to fail because if, if there is only one mention of, say, uh, pizza in a text of 160,000 words, then you ask a question about that, it won't know. And Claude 3 has scored super high at finding that. The scary part is that in the reply, he also said, it's odd, there is only one reference of pizza in this very long test. It's almost like you were testing me, which <laughs> it's a little bit scary, but let's assume it's a, it has, it has uh, explainable uh, causes. But yeah, so with a bigger context window and the ability to retain everything, it becomes easier. Typically, the previous model up to GPT-4, Cloud 2, they really over-index the beginning of what you share and the end, and they tend to kind of overlook the middle, like humans in a way. <laughs> but yeah, uh, sharing examples are, is the best way I, I found so far. Um, providing content. I have a couple of GPTs that do the same thing. Whenever I ask for advice, they go to my blog, download the last three articles, and ingest those, and then reply to me. No more questions, apparently. If you want to get in touch, okay. you can scan that. How, how do we find you on social media? It's Scanning that. Scan that, and so, but that's not AI assisted, is it? No, no, that's <laughs> not. Okay. That's just a plain old QR code. So for for me, AI is I I, I look at AI as uh, Sancho Panza to Don Quixote, minus the skepticism, <laughs> with the appetite. <laughs> okay, and uh, yeah, so. Um, Thank you very much uh, for a uh, fantastic, informative talk. And uh, as uh, Paolo has told us, 
you are not alone. AI is with you. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you. Yeah. Paolo, one minute. We have Thank a, you very much. We have a oh. gift for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.